Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tamsin Rose, and I'm a senior fellow at Friends of Europe. And this afternoon, I'm standing in for my colleague, Domendra. Welcome to this conversation where we're going to look at Green Europe, building the brand on fairness and quality. This policy debate is the second in the Connected Europe series in partnership with Vodafone, and it's an opportunity to discuss the recommendations of the Green Europe Working Group meeting that was held in March. What we're going to do today is we're going to explore the opportunities to find solution focuses in our discussions. This is an opportunity to flag up existing initiatives, potential opportunities, and further refinements that we could make to the recommendations to see how we could all play a role in a greener Europe. In registering for this event, you've received a copy of our working paper on green Europe. And that was the results of the working group in March and also the focus groups held with citizens, where we asked them what would be fair, what would be quality in Europe, we asked citizens what they thought about the balance, the appropriate balance between individual action, regulation, and what businesses should do. And you'll find a lot of very good information in there. And it's, it's become very clear that the message from the citizens is they want the green transition to be fair. It has to be convenient. It has to be low threshold, things that they can do easily. They don't want all the work to be on their shoulders to have to make the green decisions. And they also were very clear they wanted the quality to remain good. They didn't expect to see a dip in quality. In fact, some of them hoped that the green transition would mean more durable, sustainable, and useful products in their everyday life. So that's what citizens said to us when we explored these issues with us. This afternoon, we're going to look at the recommendations that came out of the working group, and we've grouped them in three big areas. So our conversation will look at these three areas. And you as participants will have opportunities to comment and to come in. You'll find in the chat the information about making sure that you're named correctly so we can call you in. You, if you have a comment or a question, you're welcome to put them in the chat. And then we'll be able to invite you to unmute and to share your views. We have a hashtag for our conversation today, and that's the Connected Europe hashtag. So please use that if you're on social media. This event is recorded and will be shared later, so other participants will be able to watch it again and contribute to this ongoing conversation, because the green transition is something that involves us all. It matters to our future, and the decisions we make as individuals and as society are the ones that will either put us on a path to a sustainable future or to a future where there is not much pleasant life in Europe or anywhere else in the world. So these are the decisions that we need to make now. And what we're going to explore is how individuals, companies, governments, and others come together to meet the same vision. So we have three clusters of conversations. And the first is going to be recommendations around the issues of standardization. Europe is, of course, above all, a regulator, a norm setter globally. In the past, European regulations around, for example, reach around chemicals has become the global standard. And you can see on your screen the standardization recommendations that we've got. And here they came forward. First of all, research and devise policies and instruments to make the most of digitalization's role in driving decarbonization. And there was a great quote from one of our citizens who said that decarbonization is the objective. That's the goal. Digitization is a tool to allow us to get there faster and together. So there's the key message around digitization. The second one is don't stop at green. Link up green impact assessments with digital opportunity assessments. Make sure that when we're exploring how to go green, we are using the latest technology because that allows us to trace what's going on. That allows us to understand the full product cycle. So link the green impact with the digital opportunities for change. And the third recommendation we have in this area of standardization is to manage the expectations of investors and credit providers 
to bring about systemic change and mainstream green investment. And we all know that one of the big problems about investment is that investors want a return on investment and they want it sh in short term. And what we're talking about is the kinds of structural major investment changes are generational. We need patient capital, long-term returns. So we need to manage the expectations of the people who are providing the funds, whether it's private equity or governments or others, so that everyone knows we're in this together for the long haul. So those are our three recommendations. And this is in our first grouping of conversation, looking at this issue of standardization. And like I said, Europe is one of the world's foremost regulators when we get it right. First of all, I'd now like to bring in the first person who's going to give us some comments, and that's Agnieszka Skoporinska, the senior EU affairs advisor at Vodafone. Tell us a little bit more about some of these recommendations and how you see these fitting into the picture. Agnieszka. Thank you very much. C can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. So first of all, it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I am working very closely with, with Dorote that you've met during, during the, the, the previous session. And uh, I am a senior advisor responsible on, on, for, for, for green economy. Um, last session was extremely fruitful and, and, and helpful uh, for, for, for us because as businesses, you know, um, we we try to have um, the bigger picture on on this on this very uh, wide issue, and um, any input and any exchange is is extremely um, valuable for our for our internal thinking and our engagement. So let me start with the European Commission quote that I spotted on Twitter this this weekend when we were celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Treaty of Paris. Um, and we celebrated with the slogan from coal and steel to green and digital. It is a great illustration of where we are heading. Um, we have clear timelines and accountabilities to deliver on the green deal. And let's make sure we do it in the most efficient way together. Um, we agree with, with the recommendations um, uh, in the sense uh, that um, digital should be seen as a tool um, as an, and a multiplier to achieve um, uh, all the objectives of the, of, the, of the Green Deal. But let's not forget that uh, ICT sector is also responsible for, for, for its own emissions. So, so we do very much focus on that. Um, we can only create... Um, uh, uh, European leadership on, on Green Deal if we, if we have sustainable networks and, and connectivity. Um, we hope uh, that thanks to recent, de recent developments such as uh, Member States Declaration on the Green and Digital Transformation and the Green Digital Coalition, uh, we can all partner to unleash the power of digital uh, to deliver um, the, the Green Deal. We, we are sometimes internally thinking, why, why should we not replicate this, this great idea of European Bauhaus uh, in construction sector to other sectors? Because it is a great, great illustration of how people from various um, professions, um, uh, ecosystems uh, with, with various res responsibilities, but all caring about the same thing can get together and have a joint vision and, and, and stop working in, 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 in silos. Um, so you probably um, heard that from from Dorote during the last session, but but of course we um, we are very much committed and 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 we try to measure uh, what what we can do uh, in the in the green space. So according to our our data, um, we can we can say that our digital solutions can reduce emissions by up to thirty seven percent in emission intense sectors such as transport, agriculture, and local transport. But as I say, all of that is, is, is possible only in partnership with, with concerned sectors. But of course, it's all, it's all about, we speak a lot about businesses and, and, and how um, Europe should become an industrial leader uh, at the same time being, being green. But above all, uh, the focus should be on citizens. So um, let's, let's make this conversation very much, very much focused on them and, and, and you know, discuss with them how it can serve them. So smart metering in your home will allow lower energy bills. A smart solution in agriculture will allow better water use or better adaptation to, um, to, 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 to various um, uh, weather uh, situations we are, we are now facing. 
to just to conclude how to achieve standardization it, a lot has been said um, in the recommendations but i just wanted to highlight that for us what is very crucial is of course data correct collection transparency education and and the right regulatory solutions uh, such as the approach incentivize versus penalize so for instance very often when when we are talking to farmers and we um explain how digital solutions can be used uh, uh, in their farms they they fear that it will be some sort of a surveillance tool um and that's not that's absolutely not what we are aiming at so there is still some some resistance um in relation to that so more education is is needed of course we have a lot of legislative tools coming that could be used for 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 our topic notably taxonomy that is being expected tomorrow um and then all all possible tools that can support technology innovation so pilots and initial deployments um of new more efficient technologies via private and and and, and public partnership to get to scale quickly uh, because what we eventually try to achieve, and that's something you've mentioned in your introduction, is to reinforce the demand side for green innovation um, and, and yeah, making green businesses uh, profitable. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka. Let me bring in uh, Corrado Pirzia Biroli um, from the Chief Executive Officer of the Rural Investment Support for Europe, the RISE Foundation. Give us your views. You're on mute. Please unmute yourself. Corrado, could you unmute yourself? You need to unmute your microphone. We still can't hear you. Okay, Corrado, we might come back to you. You need to look usually on the bottom of your screen. Within Zoom, you should see there's a microphone. There you are. Go ahead. Yes, now? yes yeah. we can hear you okay. now. Okay, thank you. So um, I totally agree with the principles of, of the working paper, of course, but the devil is, is in the details, as one can imagine. Uh, and my focus will be, uh, because one has to focus uh, on renewable energies and on two aspects, that is the regulatory framework and the citizen rights. On the regulatory framework, um, it is, there's a lack today of a fully fledged assessment in the framework regarding the zero carbon target for 2050. The monetizing the impacts of the social economic, uh, eco social economic and health impacts and the effects on administrative procedures and red tape, including the credibility of the whole GND. And the question is, if one wants indicators, one has to make sure that the basis is right to establish them. And there is one question only I will put at this po point on that. That is, that does the um, impact assessment, um, uh, does the impact assessment assess what carbon price must be reached to achieve the new Green Deal? And the question is, it is not established and without establishing a growing carbon price between now and 2030 we can forget about the whole exercise because it won't work the second aspect always of impact is the co2 emission savings now the indicators so far by the commission let alone by the promoters are overblown the Commission speaks of a range of 600, 900 million tons uh, in, two, uh, in 2020. But in reality, if you look at the figures in Germany and Ireland, the reduction actually delivered is only a few, a few million tons. And some other studies say that the real uh, figures are 44% of what the Commission is saying. But well, this is very important to see that uh, if we establish uh, indicators. Uh, now, the second, the second aspect is the citizen rights. Uh, and although the uh, renewable energy policy is potentially participative and amenable to decentralization, it is affected by lack of transparency, legal compliance problems, 
discrimination in favor of powerful interests, the promoters, failure to secure public information and participation, and by citizens' difficulties of recourse. Uh, and uh, the transparency on the transparency area, I would say that the promoters or sellers do not want the user or buyer to have all the information available on uh, renewable energy products and services, such as real costs, mutual performance, and life cycle uh, emissions. And the lack of transparency is, of course, worrying the user. And in order to avoid landowners' opposition, they are prepared now, the promoters, to offer in Belgium 20,000 euro per year per turbine for 20 years. And a contract is a half of a contract, whatever it is, but this is a Leonine contract, which could be, of course, discussed in terms of the legality of it. Uh, then I would say uh, sound pollution. That will be my last, my last point. The sound pollution, the turbine installations sidestep the precautionary principle. Noise indicators and limits are called for. In Germany, there is a law, the Infraschall study of August 2019 by the German Bundestag, which highlights the health impacts of wind turbine noise. And the costs of numerous uh, financial settlements which citizens get from the promoters. The new law now, the amendment, says that even the authorities granting permits, which provide too much noise, will have to pay, which of course will make giving permits more difficult. And in France and other countries, there is a limit of 1,500 meters, in Canada, 2,500 meters between these okay. turbines. Corrado. Home. Can, yeah, can I ask you to, to wrap up so I can bring in some other people? You've, you've raised some yeah. important points that... I, I finished here. Thank and, you. And I finished here. The question is, if you want indicators which work, one has to know what one is talking about. Okay. Thank you. Good points. And, and we're going to come to that, I think, in the, in the next block of conversation where we're going to look at transparency and what are we measuring? What are the benchmarks? Yeah. And I think you've raised this important issue about trust, because yeah. if we're not transparent, we can't trust what's being done and the information, then it's, there won't be the buy-in and people need to know yeah. what's going on. Thank yeah. you. I'm going to bring in a few more people who, who and please feel free to add your comments in the chat. So, uh, Jake, Jacob Hassler from the uh, Fox 19 is a European young leader and a member of our Connected Europe working group. Jacob, can I invite you to comment on some of these elements? I think we're having some difficulty getting through. Okay, let's go to the next person. Jacob, I'm sorry, the connection yes, is very hello. poor. I hope my... Yes, I'm in I'm in southern England, I'm afraid, and I have ah. bad I'm quarantining here and I have bad uh Okay, go ahead. It's not Vodafone, it's British Tele British Telecom is the culprit. Um yeah, so my, my comments on standardization I think are more on the what I would say the underbelly of it, which is the whole asset and investment side of it. And I think in, ref in, in response to the comments made in the paper, I would like to make three very short points. The number one, I think, is is that when it says we need patient capital, the answer is yes, but we need to make sure that we allocate according to capital productivity, because capital productivity does matter. There is not an unlimited supply of capital, so we need to make sure that our investments are in the are the right ones. Even though that's what my first point. The second point about the patient capital, I think, is is about what we really need at this stage is an agreement on how to actually value assets as a result of the impact of a green transformation. And I think that's where today banks and investors are struggling because there is not a common standard yet. And I think the European Union is proposing one or is working on one, and that is absolutely crucial so that we know 
how assets that may be linked to, for example, fossil energy, how shall they be valued in the balance sheet? As soon as that's clear, investors will naturally shift away money from those assets to other assets, because we will then see the real impact of the energy transition on fossil-related assets. And today, that, that's not clear. And I think it's one of the major impediments to a more massive shift of investment from traditional assets into the more green transition-based assets. And the third point in relation to that I would like to raise is, is about corporate governance, the standards about executive remuneration, the way the short-termism of shareholder capitalism is working. I think the asset managers who own on behalf of investors or who manage on behalf of investors the investments they have switched most of them do not have a short-term investment perspective what's the problem today is to translate the interests of the asset owners into a workable corporate governance so that the corporations and their management are incentivized properly to actually work in the long-term interest of the shareholder who usually has a long-term interest. It's pension funds, it's all our retirement pensions. And you may imagine if, if one retires in 20, 30 or 40 years from now, one has every interest that the assets that are being purchased are actually resilient and in line with the green transformation we all need. But I think today we are not clear enough about how to translate that requirement from actually the majority of investors into concrete corporate governance principles. That would be my three points, and I give back to the Thank you. Group. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Some very good, very concrete messages there, looking at the way that we value things, and we have to have an agreement on that, and so everyone is doing it in the same way. And once that agreement is there, you know, you would see that translated into the way that balance sheets are done and then hopefully into the way that companies are governed. Thank you. Let me bring in Andrea Merati from an economic advisor for the European Commission DG on Economic and Financial Affairs. Andrea. Thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and nice to, uh, to be with you again. Um, I think it's, uh, um, I mean, it's important to put things in, into the, into a broader context and, I mean, to look at the European Green Deal pre-COVID and the post-COVID uh, recovery. Um, I think, uh, I mean, digitalization can be, I think it has been said, a catalyst, an enabler, or even accelerate the, the green transition. But, I mean, things will not uh, happen automatically. I mean, digitalization does not lead automatically to, uh, to sustainability. So, I mean, these processes need to be guided and accompanied, managed uh, somehow. And we have to devise uh, pathways, um, policies, and actions for making digitalization a real enabler. Um, I think, uh, I mean, in December, I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, the ministerial declaration has set out the I mean, the policy framework and has asked the Commission to act upon a number of things, uh, in particular on, on, um, on the sustainable uh, uh, product policy framework that the Commission is, is, uh, will put forward and which will include the digital product passports. I think if the issue is, I mean, how to deliver sustainable products, services, and also investments, as, as it has been said, I think we need uh, a number a number of things. Uh, <clears throat> I think what is important is to align the, the policy agendas. I think it's, I mean, initially, I mean, the two agendas, the green and the digital, were promoted separately. So now there is scope for more, <clears throat> um, uh, for more uh, collaborative actions between the these two worlds. Um, I mean, if you look at the, um, I mean, the digital solutions for, um, for example, digital product uh, passports, tagging, I mean, we have to recognize in terms of standardization that there are challenges which have to be addressed, uh, not the least, I mean, access to reliable uh, standardized data, 
and, as it has been said, ensuring trust among stakeholders along the, the supply chain. We also need guidelines for uh, mapping and tracking products, uh, materials across the, poly the, poly the, the supply chains with minimum uh, criteria for sharing data. Um, we could think about stakeholder platforms. We could think about pilot uh, actions on product value chains, for example, on the, uh, the key sectors that the circular economy action plan has identified, and in particular on electric vehicles, batteries, packaging, and so forth. Um, I mean, all these, um, I mean, requires also to, to look at two, two dimensions which are important. One is the global dimension. We need global collaboration. I think it's important when we talk about the green transition. And the second one is the, the fairness, the inclusivity, um, both in terms of affordable products, but also in terms of preparing consumers, citizens to, um, um, I mean, to be, to be more engaged. And that means we need to, uh, we need digital literacy, digital skills. On the second recommendation, um, I mean, how to pair the, the green impact assessments and the dig digital opportunity assessments. I think that could be appealing uh, at first sight, but I think it's, it's important, I think, to have a comprehensive assessment of the risks, not only the opportunities in terms of what technologies are available, but to look at the risks and, and the costs which are involved. In particular, the environmental cost, uh, in, um, and I mean, we—it's—I it, mean, we have a standard, we have the taxonomy that would help, but I think we we should think in terms: what is the value, um, the broader value for society of all that? Okay. Um, Thank you, Andrea. And 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 the third point, very briefly, on on the expectations of investors and credit, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I fully agree with what Jakob Hasler has said, I think we have a range of financing instruments. I mean, look at in, InvestEU, for example, is one of the, the instruments that uh, is available, I mean, for de-risking and for providing this patient finance that, that we need. Because, I mean, all these investments will have long-term returns. And, and therefore, you have to provide this, this kind of uh, I mean, long-term, I mean, capital uh, capital financing, and also the possibility to scale up, I mean, uh, innovative business solutions that would be, uh, that would be needed. Uh, one thing which is, I mean, if you want to deliver, to bring about this systemic change, it's, I mean, we need time, I mean, because returns will be in the long-term. Um, okay. And, and, the, and the last, very last point is on uh, green public procurement criteria, which is also, which, which, which are criteria which are available if you want to promote, I mean, these kind of sustainable uh, business models that, uh, that would be uh, emerging during, I mean, the, the green transition. Thank you. Thank you. And we're starting to get some comments in the chat. And let me encourage you to put your messages in there. We, we had raised um, by Corrado, he said, you know, we need to be clear on what is the carbon price that we need in order to achieve the green transition. So if you've got a comment in that, put it in the chat. What should we be looking at? He also highlighted that the Commission's estimations of CO2 savings are wildly over optimistic and we need to be realistic there and um, we've had messages there about corporate governance and how this needs to change and we only need to look at what recently happened where you had the ceo of danone a global company that was committed to the green transition was very progressive in what he was doing and was ousted by shareholder activism who wanted return on their capital in a shorter event so i think i'd come back on this question about whether investors have got the long-term message there that uh, was raised by Jacob. He said that actually the asset owners are already looking in the long term. And I think not everyone's got the same message. Like I said, look at what happened to the CEO um, of Danone. Let me bring in now Fabio Marchetti from the um, Generali Group and a member of the Connected Europe Working Group. We're now getting into the nitty gritty of how companies are financed, what incentives exist in the market, what's the role of the regulator to help make that happen. And this is your area of expertise. Fabio, come in, please. 
Well, thank you very much, and, and, and thank you for the great moderation of this event. Um, as an asset manager and an insurer, we have 650 billion euros uh, worth uh, of assets uh, under management. The insurance industry as a whole in Europe is worth 11 trillion euros. So we're talking about an incredible investment firepower uh, that could certainly help in uh, uh, financing this transition. Now, as long-term investors, we need to make sure that we match our assets with our liabilities. And in this context, our strategy is to invest our assets sustainably, not only because we believe it is the right thing to do, but also because we do not want to be left with stranded assets on our balance sheet, as Jakob was implying in the previous intervention. So to achieve a net zero target in our investments, but also to understand how ESG factors impact our business, we need a common grammar with common metrics. And this is where standardization comes into play and will be a central piece to achieve our shared sustainability objectives. If I can give you two quick examples where uh, standardization will be key. First of all, disclosure of information. So tomorrow, this is important, the commission will come forward with a proposal to review the non-financial reporting directive with developments of EU specific sustainability standards. Now this piece of legislation is crucial to complete the ESG puzzle we're talking about. And it is crucial to complete the taxonomy regulation and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. So as investors, we need policy that can tell us how companies are doing vis-a-vis -vis their sustainability engagements and that facilitates the identification of that data. So standardization of reporting and disclosure will help us achieve this. Now at the same time, uh, and this is something that I don't think has been raised yet, uh, as a global uh, insurer, we need to make sure that we are speaking the same green language also when we are investing in Brazil, China, or in the US. And this is why these sustainability standards need to be aligned with the global initiatives led by the TCFD and other uh, institutions. Uh, it would be a real shame for Europe, who is leading the sustainability race, to be a victim of its success by imposing complex metrics which hamper international investments. And with the Biden administration on board now, uh, um, you know, we've seen that the discussions towards conversion are, are actually ongoing, and this is excellent, excellent news. If I can, just a second uh, minor point, which is very important as well, it's on green bonds. I mean, green bonds play an increasingly important role in financing assets needed for the low carbon transition. And in addition to our sustainable investment strategy, we are generally have set up a green bond framework with strict rules around the use of proceeds, selecting and evaluating projects, managing the proceeds and reporting. Now, in this context, we really want to encourage the European Com Commission in its effort to develop a EU green bond standard, which is key to redirect sustainable investment flows in the EU. And furthermore, we are uh, coming very close to the, uh, 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 to the revision of the Solvency II directive, which actually it's, it's the rule book, I would say, of the insurance sector. This is an opportunity to transform Solvency II into an enabler of uh, investments into the green transition. And we want to make sure, and we came up with a proposal as well, to allow green bonds to have a lower capital standard so that we can have that invest incentive to invest in those, in those uh, asset classes. As of, as of today, investing in a green bond is more considered more risky than investing in government bonds. And this is totally uh, nonsense because we've seen even during the COVID crisis that the green bonds have been very resilient. And there is a cost of capital that is absolutely excessive yeah. with respect to the actual risk green bonds represent. So we think okay. uh, even at the institutional level, we need to be consistent with what we say and take advantage of these regulatory opportunities to unleash the tremendous investment potential that we have. Uh, thank you for that, Fabio, and for rem reminding us just how useful the insurance industry can be in helping to finance and manage this. Uh, you mentioned a couple of um, rather uh, 
unaccessible sounding different uh, piece of legislation, the Solvency II Directive and then non-financial uh, reporting regulation, both of which are sort of EU mechanisms to help shift the agenda. I'm going to move us now into our next um, session where we're going to be looking at this issue of transparency because the, uh, under transparency, our recommendation, what gets measured gets done. And we need to improve the way progress is benchmarked and tracked. Now, a lot of these points that people have raised, and we've got some more coming up in the chat, thank you for, for bringing that up, are about, you know, what's the framework that's there, the regulatory framework, the agreements that need to be made about carbon pricing, CO2 emissions and others, so everyone knows where they're going, everyone can align, and we can move towards that collectively. Um, and I, on this one, I'd like to bring in um, a senior fellow here at Friends of Europe, that's Tavi Roivas. If you'd like to comment on this issue, important issue of transparency. Yes, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this um, uh, current discussion. There's uh, so many great ideas to, um, to hear and, and so, so many thoughts that, that came to my mind uh, uh, also. Uh, uh, first of all, if I may reflect on this um, investments uh, topic uh, slightly, I think uh, perhaps it's like the optimist uh, talking in me, but uh, I think that the uh, very strong uh, buy-in of uh, EU and US uh, combined that has happened uh, over the last year, focusing on these topics, has actually created or at least helped the private sector to to push on this as well. You know. It, we have a number of things. Uh, perhaps the most uh, visible is Tesla stock uh, skyrocketing uh, that uh, shows that also private money believes that the policy is going green. Uh, there will be uh, lots of things happening there. And thus, it makes sense to take my own money from perhaps some legacy sectors to, to do also uh, uh, a bit more uh, for the environment and, and invest uh, there. So, so I think that the public money has actually already, uh, and public not only money, but the public policy has already uh, influenced uh, this considerably. And another thing uh, that I, I wanted to reflect on very quickly is also the fairness part. Uh, I, I do understand that this has been a topic and I, I kind of do feel it because I also live in, in a climate uh, where we have always no, in a way, you need a four-wheel drive car to uh, to actually drive here in Estonia during winter time, but you know you can also address it from the other angle and look at your children and think if it's fair to leave them with a world that is um, is uh, no longer sustainable or, or not uh, not possible for them to um, to inherit to to their grandchildren. So there are like different angles of fairness. And I, I believe that this is of personal um, personal uh, responsibility in, in a way as well. Uh, also, I, I very much love the idea of uh, uh, neighborhoods and, and streets uh, being uh, different colors and then starting monitoring it. Uh, this is one of the cases where actually you can uh, uh, take this um, positive um, kind of, I want to be better than my neighbor, or I, I want to be even as good as, as my neighbor, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, put it in the, in the kind of context of, of what can I do to make my neighborhood greener? What can I do to contribute? Already uh, 10 years ago, I saw this being very well happening in one Finnish uh, um, commercial building where all the people who uh, uh, worked there, their collective challenge was to keep uh, one iceberg uh, from melting. And the iceberg was on this uh, LCD uh, screen uh, in the lobby. And, and they all, whatever uh, heat they used, whatever window they kept open, everything affected that. And, and they all were very conscious of, of keeping the, the iceberg uh, from melting. So every day they had the same challenge and every day almost uh, they survived uh, this. So yeah, this is very quickly what I what I wanted to add. Uh, thank I, thank I you for that. 
and, and we'll all keep our eyes collectively on the icebergs that we, we need not to melt. Let me now bring in Nuno Lacasta, the CEO from the Portuguese Environment Agency, because I think this is a very important point we've got here about measurement. And we've now got sort of 30 or 40 years worth of environmental measurements and indexes, etc. cetera. So uh, if, the, if the recommendation is that we need to improve the way that we are benchmarking and tracking progress. Obviously, you're an agency that, that already is mo monitoring hundreds of different benchmarks out there. What else do we need? Do we need new ones? Do we need to connect them? What's your view on this? Well, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's a, that's a very interesting question because on the one hand, indeed, we have loads of information. Uh, a lot of that information, actually, we're not even able at this point to process and do it and use it towards, for instance, predictive monitoring. We could do that and we will do that in, in, in due course with artificial intelligence and bringing together existing tools. On the other hand, we also need to develop new tools, new information data sets. And let me just very quickly touch upon uh, a couple of aspects. I guess first, um, Digital transformation and green transformation kind of go hand in hand. I'm not sure whether when one says it's they're twins or some, something of that sort, but they clearly go hand in hand. And that's very important. And um, the, the, the previous EU uh, Council presidency, the German presidency, sort of put digitalization on the center stage of the agenda. We, in the, as a current presidency, have sort of picked that up. And I think that's very important because we need to, to with that in mind, uh, move forward on this agenda. We need to monitor the deployment of European funds, including now resilience funds, so as to make sure that we don't um, actually that we're able to monitor that huge percentage of funds that go to climate change, so as not to foster greenwashing, so as not to, uh, for instance, see these funds go into activities which have little to do with climate change mitigation and or adaptation, uh, and that's a challenge. Some of the metrics are not quite yet there. Let me give you one example in my own country. We have for a long time, in fact, been putting money onto what effectively is climate, uh, coastal climate adaptation, in other words, protecting sand dunes and or uh, revamping existing constructions. With that in mind, we began having a metrics in terms of so-called grazing uh, 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 beach protections. And we sort of come to the conclusion in the last 20 years, on average, these have been raised 15 to 20 centimeters. Now that's great that we have that information, but we don't have a standardized information in terms of figuring out whether that's just by chance or is something that we can actually use going forward. By this, I mean, if we do not know this, we will we will likely be throwing money onto resolving uh, potential adaptation challenges without really knowing whether that's the right money. So what, in other words, we need to have these metrics in order to calculate incremental costs for adaptation. The same goes for so that's one challenge. Very quickly, and I want to touch upon something that uh, most people have said before, really, the financial sector and, in fact, business schools are currently part of the problem. They're not part of the solution quite yet. We need to completely change the mindset of business schools and the financials because, as was said earlier, or perhaps written in a comment, their financial appraisal is short term. They care nothing about mid to long term. And as a result, what we're really seeing is that money is going to uh, uh, actions, and I'll finish here, that really have nothing to do with a, a more uh, mid to long term horizon spans that we need to do for, for climate mitigation. And I'm going to give you another example. Again, in, in my own country, we're doing an impact assessment of a, of a hotel near the shoreline. And uh, when we ask the promoter in the context of impact assessment, what about uh, sea level rise? And the answer was, well, that's the problem. I'll give my money back in seven years. This, is, this shows exactly, well, first of all, he didn't understand the question. And second, nor did the, the banks that financed that investment. Because frankly, this only means that in seven years, 10 years time, whatever, I get my money back and somebody else come and, and sort this out. So there, these are huge challenges. Uh, I think initiatives such as the uh, Sustainable Products Initiative, the Digital Coalition, coalition uh, that we have out there have, have started bringing value to the fore. Uh, and I would urge people to indeed, with regard to the SPI, to participate in the public participation that's ongoing until June the 9th. Thanks very much. 
Thank you very much, Nuno. You've given us a couple of really concrete examples of some of the challenges. And as you say, we, we already have a huge amount of data. We don't necessarily how to process it, or we don't have the knowledge in order to understand what that information is telling us and how we use it. Um, and this issue of short-termism is, is still a problem when we're looking at financing of individual projects. We've got some more comments in the chat which, which are extremely useful. Uh, Fabio has just made the point that not only do we need this, the serious carbon price to speed things up, but we need to make sure that we are inclusive and that part of the money that could be raised through this carbon tax needs to be put into reskilling and helping people and sectors that are going to be most affected because otherwise people will abandon their commitment, people will not be involved. And you saw that very clearly in the citizens panel that not, they don't want too much responsibility and burden on them as individuals to have to make the changes. So this is, I think, a useful point. Please keep the uh, comments coming in the, the chat. I'd now like to bring in Lindsay nefesh Clark, um, who's a Connected Europe Senior Fellow here at Friends of Europe and the CEO of W4.org. Lindsay, what are you hearing? Thank Thank you. Thank you, Rose, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, well, look, um, I mean, I think there's a consensus here. We all know, you know, we cannot overstate the importance, I wouldn't say the importance, the urgency of transparency and metrics. Um, following on from what some of the previous speakers have said. So, for example, can we be hopeful when we see that there's this nascent um, European green digital coalition that could be this opportunity to align the green and um, digital um, uh, uh, transitions? And if you look at, you know, the points that are listed in that uh, declaration, well, they talk about standardized and interoperable European data spaces, precisely to unleash the potential uh, of data to realize the European Green Deal, to um, empower uh, consumers to make um, smart, sustainable choices. As I was listening to everybody speaking, it, it really made me think, you know, we're, as with a lot of the most intractable um, problems that we face, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem with the risk reward. I mean, whether we're talking about the valuation of assets um, and how we can bring about a paradigm shift in terms of the um, um, financing and investment, uh, whether we're talking about the reporting, it was very heartening to hear Fabio say that, um, are we moving towards legislation? where you know it will be mandatory to disclose these th this data that has existed it's been around for a long long time but of course it's not mandatory we're in the domain of soft law um so you know we have all these tools but if we don't if we don't get it right in terms of the metrics and the transparency empowering all players um from the citizens, consumers, right the way through to the companies, and it's also empowering and can be incentivizing, then we've got a problem with the risk reward. And as long as we have a risk reward, it's not gonna shift. So, you know, if I look at the um, recommendations of this working group um, and all the discussions so far, my maybe my question again to some of the members of the European Commission and the European Parliament or companies that have been involved in this, um, the, this initial, um, uh, a group of uh, CEOs, corporates working hand in hand with the European Commission and, and small to medium sized enterprises is, you know, where is this framework going to come from? I mean, we've got it coming in from different sides. There's DESI, the possibility of incorporating the green indicators. You've got the European Green Digital uh, Coalition, but it's urgent. And I would say it's the biggest investment we need to make is getting that framework right, those metrics and that transparency. Thank you, Lindsay. Let me bring in uh, Agnesha again from uh, Vodafone. Maybe you want to pick up on some of those points, particularly that have been coming through, which is how we get the risk-reward balance right. And at the moment, it's, the cap it's more expensive for the capital for green bonds than for government bonds. So that, that's, there's clearly something that's not working there. Agnieszka. Yes, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Lindsay, for, for, for your call. Um, by joining the or co-founding the, the the green uh, digital coalition of private sector, um, that's our priority to to somehow build the metrics and 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 measure what 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 we are saying so that the words do not remain words. And it is in everyone's interest um, that we can uh, that we can um, concretely support our our cases in various sectors with concrete data. Uh, and and just to reassure you, we just don't, we we have not launched it just to you know just to launch another platform. Um, we really hope that it will it will it will it will bring concrete uh, results. So um, 
for us, accountability is, is key because eventually that's that's the word that, that fits very well here um, in this in this session. Um, and we have very concrete um, uh, suggestions on how to enhance this accountability. And these suggestions are from our day to work, day to day work. So one of the solutions we, we are we are promoting is the uh, enhanced um, European Commission Digital Economy and Society Index, so DESI. Uh, with the green element to measure how digital can deliver against climate objectives um, and support economic growth. Um, of course, we understand that this is very much um, digital, digital bubble um, uh, tool. So we also want to expand it to, 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 to other areas. And we will tomorrow see the communication about the EU taxonomy. So we also hope that based on what we come up with within 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 the uh, the coalition and the metrics we can maybe one day build some sort of um, enablement uh, part in in in, in taxonomy uh, work and finally we should also emphasize um, more this green uh, dual green and digital investments in the european semester because after all they are the the strategic guidance for for member states uh, for the implementation of the recovery fund um so 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 yes as, as we often hear uh we will be held accountable uh by by next generation on how we spend fund this money and how we build our policies so uh so yeah we are very much committed to to participate in in and and, and having concrete results in that sphere. thank you i think you've given us a nice bridge to the third block of conversation we wanted to have which is the issue around trust because you know this is an area that we, we have to have a system that everyone agrees on and has confidence in so that it can be the basis for action. So here are our recommendations that have come out so far. The first one here is that ensuring that the twin transitions, the digital transition and the carbon transition, remain intrinsically linked to economic and social realities. Those issues have been, have been put in the chat at various points to make sure that we can believe in the data that's being put out there, the figures, that the impact assessment can be relied on, and that you know, people feel part of the process. Ensuring that the green transition is designed and implemented as a winning proposition for citizens. Um, and this is, you know, so that it, we, we, we had elements in the working paper about the fact that people didn't want to talk about sacrifice. The idea that at the moment the green transition is all about giving up stuff, giving up things that make our modern life convenient. And that this, this is not a way to win friends. This is not a way to win allies and get people committed. But it needs to be framed as a winning proposition that the green transition can and will not only maintain quality of life, but improve it. It will be better for everyone. And the third recommendation is about communication. We need to communicate and do it creatively so that people be engaged and can be part of the story here. So these are our three recommendations around this issue of trust. And I know they're going to be important because it's, it's key. Let me invite uh, the first person to come in on this is Sirpi Pitakainen, a member of the European Parliament and a member of the Connected Europe uh, MEP group. I see you've just joined us. Sipa, hello, welcome. What would you like to say yeah. on these recommendations, particularly around trust, communication and involvement? Well, uh, first of all, I think that they are very crucial. Secondly, uh, the trust, of course, means that we can trust that everybody does they share. We trust that those ones uh, who can afford to do more are doing more. And we trust uh, that uh, it is going to improve our live, uh, livelihoods. And that comes to uh, my thinking on uh, four sort of uh, uh, outcomes that we are still not putting on place effectively. First, and that is the green transition. It is not a choice, it's a must. And we shouldn't undermine the actions what we are doing because then we just need to double or triple to do them and it is going to harm our economies and people's trusts and it is going to harm people's livelihoods. So uh, put the benchmark right and on the right level and take it seriously. There is no uh, uh, option, there's no plan B. And the higher 
the longer you wait, the more expensive it is going to be and the more resistance by the people you are going to face. So uh, raise the bar, uh, act accordingly that we have a climate emergency and biodiversity emergency. emergency. Take backcasting action and uh, take into account that uh, with tenth of the resource we would need to produce the same welfare uh, by 2050. And basically, if we are listening to the science, we would be uh, being uh, carbon neutral by 2030, 35, not pushing it to 2050 as we are doing. Then the second part of the trust, and I'm going, not going to talk so much about it, but I really would like to see more these kind of initiatives like Bauhaus, where the idea is that you create better environments, better housing, uh, better living, like with the resources of renovation maybe included, and you make affordable, accessible, and uh, uh, jointly co-created, jointly planned environments where the livelihood of everybody is better and the mobility is better if you can move and catch your, your services and workplaces with the public transportation and with your feet instead of a cars when now we are building the structures around the cars. It is a huge change, but if we do not do it so that everybody benefits, and especially the vulnerable groups benefit more, there's no chance. Okay. Then about the third part of the trust, and this is actually the most difficult to me, is how you can trust the politicians, how you can trust the system, and how you can trust when uh, politics is telling to you, okay, we have climate law and we have 55 uh, 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 percent reduction target by 2050, and now we claim it is enough. Science tells it is not, and we know it is not. How can you put the responsibility so that the decisions are science-based, based on indicators and life cycle analysis in the politics? How you can really put the politics and politicians trustworthy and reliable on what they decide and to make the facing of the consequences so that they wouldn't be so vulnerable for the policy lobbying of the laggards that are very voicey and very aggressive in, uh, in, in businesses and in our societies. And this is on the crux. And this is actually the crux of the democracy. Can we work in the democracy and listening in the people so that you listen also the weak voices. Tough you question. act against the strong aggressive lobbies and you base your actions on science. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Sippy, and reminding us that it's the tough questions. Can we trust our, our politicians? Do we have the data on the life cycle analysis to be able to bring this in? Let me now bring in Anna Telez uh, for an, an advisor to the European Commission. Anna, another view from Europe. Go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, I, I've tried to gather some, some bullet points because it's, trust is such an issue and, and uh, it's never, never simple. It is something you, you build in time. So it isn't, it isn't easy to, to trust politicians because you, they don't have the, the best record in, in the past. So you have to, to really um, know that one person isn't the entire politician class. But uh, um, perhaps with the inoculation initiative uh, for fake news, because we, we have a lot of fake news for these. Uh, and uh, with a truth barometer on several news on decarbonization, uh, a, a task force for green transition communication with psychologists, marketeers, sociologists, 
and, uh, and other social sciences professionals in order to sustain a coherent message. It will help building trust. Uh, we also, fear is at the center of distrust. Fear to be jobless, fear to not have the money to, to support the costs for this long-term uh, investment we, we've heard. Um, so we, we need to, to create some partnerships with the private sector for, for training, to support training uh, for the, the workforce and uh, for innovation in, in industry to, to get the, the application of, of the technology in real work. Um, engaging the communities through town halls and local associations, of course, but also uh, making, making them responsible for, for supporting the community in this transition and reskilling. Uh, risk okay. So, with, with training. Um, Thanks, we Anna. A lot, a lot more, but we, <laughs> we don't have the, the time. So, I'll several ideas is, is, is the key. Great, thank you. And you've, you've raised the, the fact that it is, we, we've, we've had in the chat and you've also raised it, this issue of fake data, fake news, and that undermines public trust and public's willingness to participate and be part of it. And you also again highlighted for us the issue of fear. People are worried about their jobs, about their lifestyles, about their future, about the, the uh, sustainability of their own society. So these are big questions that people are facing because the, the climate um, crisis and the green transition questions everything about the way that we live, the way that we work, the way our societies function. And when you question at that level, it can be very concerning and raise a lot of fear and resistance very quickly. There's a couple of other people I'd like to bring in on this. Uh, Yvonne Pereira Martins, I'd like to bring you in. Um, you're from the European Environment Agency dealing with urban sustainability strategic coordination. Most of us here in Europe live in cities, so you know it's at city level and in urban environments that a lot of these changes will need to happen. The decisions about investment, about housing, about mobility, all of these will happen in cities. Yvonne, what would you like to share with us? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I would like to go back to, to, to the beginning, you know, in the European Green Deal. I think the European Green Deal created um, a great opportunity to rethink things about uh, environment, climate and sustainability. And it's a quite simple um, and short document, but it's, let's, let's put it, it's, it, it underneath is full of complexity and we have seen it from the debate already. And having all this complexity, I think when uh, we are talking about trust, we have to translate this complexity in some simple and easy messages. For instance, uh, are we talking about green? Are we talking about digital? Are we talking about green digital? Are we talking about reindustrializing Europe? And I think all these aspects need to be very clear. For instance, when we talk about well, a sustainable lifestyle. What is a sustainable lifestyle? And I think we need sometimes to create trust, to, to be very, very uh, simple and, and really have messages that reach people. Um, then the other thing is is how to generate trust, and and I think um, I think it's it's a, it's a need for involvement of those that can generate trust, and these are generally the ones that are more um, close to people, because uh, we live in 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 digital. And I, I have to say that uh, in this pandemic uh, moment, if something has taught us that societies that are more digital coped better and and really reacted better and and i think this is something that we need to retain as well but about this uh, general trust i think and it comes to your point i think the involvement of the local authorities and the cities where 70 percent 75 percent of uh, european people live uh, and it's growing um i think is absolutely uh, a key aspect and when i'm talking about the local the city i'm also talking about other 
um, components of the civil society, like for instance, environmental NGOs, or for instance, uh, consumers uh, networks, and they are all spread around Europe, and they can really have a huge uh, influence uh, in creating the trust. Um, I, I just uh, mentioned that the previous presidency, the German presidency, uh, launched the, the, the uh, revamp, in, uh, revamp Leipzig Charter, and that calls really for the role of cities in these just and green uh, transitions. Um, then I would say that also um, the, the, the proximity and the creation of mediators, uh, and namely uh, um, uh, digital mediators, I think is a very important aspect, because one of the thing is that uh, I think there is stratification, uh, you know, across countries in Europe, uh, across age groups and across income groups. And I think this is important that we factor this in if we want to have um, a fair Europe uh, um, a par with a sustainable Europe. Um, then I think the, um, the issue, um, for instance, uh, we need, of course, to have a, a shared economy. Uh, but when we uh, and our agency has, as uh, with our State of the Environment uh, report, we call for this this uh, shared economy. But then there is this dissonance of discourses, for instance, that comes through the media, uh, and that's really uh, contradict completely this uh, objective of shared. Okay. Um, and finally, just one point. I think yeah. the metrics need to be reassessed. Whenever we increase the GDP, generally we lose an ecosystem. And this is uh, something that we need to talk about. Thank you very much. And uh, we've got some interesting points being raised here in the chat, picking up on this issue of how you communicate with citizens, how you engage them and bring them on, on board. The conversation earlier, and it, you see it in the working paper, is to not make, not try to sort of make citizens feel they have to sacrifice, they're going to give up some of the stuff they like and they value. And we talked about a win-win situation. And Malta, his point in the chat has challenged us to say, well, if we're actually going to meet decarbonization, uh, decarbonization goals, and given that Western countries have to overconsumption of limited resources, it's unavoidable that our standard of living is going to be affected. So we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't sugar, um, sugarcoat it, make it clear that life will change and it won't always be a magic future where all of our goods and services continue in the same way they are just greener there will be changes to the way that we live and we work interesting and quite challenging point let me stay on the issue of local and let me bring in philippa roberts the legal advisor to the representation of salzburg to the eu yvonne was very clear that it's cities where 75% um, of us live in Europe is where it's at the hard point between the rock and the hard place where citizens want clean air, but they also want to be able to drive. They want bu public transport, but they don't want to pay too much for it. So it's some of these big trade-offs that you see have to be applied at the local level. So what's the perspective that you see looking at how we can bring the green transition and support it with digital? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm speaking today on behalf of Mrs. Petz Michier, um, the head of the EU representation office Salzburg. So as you already mentioned, trust is something that you have to earn. So what, is, what has to happen is that the member states stick to the action plans, stick to the strategies and show we can actually do what we, we don't only have ideas, we're actually fulfilling them, we're really going moving forward. Um, so right now, it is very crucial that the EU moves forward as a whole in every EU policy areas, um, that we do not have politicians that contradict themselves, that uh, there, it should be clear that the um, common agriculture policy is um, more greener than that is discussed right now in the parliament. So really show the citizens we have changed and we want to take you with us. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Philippa. Again, so it's about getting clarity in the political direction and communicating clearly so people understand and that when governments make commitments in one area, they should actually implement them. I'm going to pick up on something here, which is we, you've had some co comments in the chat and it's come up about the importance of this being a global issue. We need to set carbon prices globally. We need to agree on how to value assets globally. Somebody else mentioned that the Bi new Biden administration is an important opportunity because now Europe has a clear partner to move forward. So let me bring in some of the viewpoints from North America. And let me bring in Rob, uh, Rob Shirky. He's a, an EYL from North America, the uh, Canada director of Our Horizon. Um, from the north, you know, just slightly north of the Biden administration there, but looking at the North American continent, do we have now a window of opportunity where Europe and North America could really start to shift things? Is everything aligned? Uh, I think possibly given a, a recent shift in politics in, in the United States, and for, now I see myself on the screen, I want to apologize for my ridiculous mustache. We're in lockdown in Ontario, and this is me going stir crazy. Um, this, isn't, this isn't sincere, this is just absurdity. Um, I, I wanted to actually go back to, I read the working paper, and, uh, and just to speak to sort of uh, distrust, and a theme that I saw come up in the focus group participants was sort of, um, this distrust of, of government and uh, and business and this distinction between sort of individual action and and business and government action and I wanted to suggest that that's sort of a false dichotomy because at the end of the day I mean what is a, a business without its customers right what is a government without an electorate voters to to support that government so I think a, a recognition and maybe a shift in our narrative that we are a part of this problem as individuals collectively and that that's not a bad thing that's a good thing because um you know what is being responsible for a problem other than having an ability to respond to it so one of the things i think in north america is we really ignore the demand side of the equation and i think that's actually political and ideo ideological but to segue then if we recognize that part of the equation to segue to what i thought was wonderful on uh, disclosure and transparency and, and in this segment communication. Uh, yes to all of those. I think so much of what we do that's unsustainable can be driven by disconnect. So uh, the impacts of our fossil fuels, I'm not really connected to those behaviors. Uh, the horrors of factory farming, you know, there's a disconnect there. And through uh, disclosure, through transparency, uh, we can facilitate connection. We can sort of close those experiential gaps that then impacts consumer demand, which in turn then affects how businesses and, and governments respond. So, you know, if I'm the CEO of a company and I see people are less and less interested in a particular solution, more interested in others, I'm then incentivized to deliver that solution to, solution to market. Similarly, you know, if I'm in government and people are less happy with, with a particular policy, there's a shift in demand in the electorate, then I'm now going to implement other policies. So, uh, I think definitely we need to speak more about uh, the, the tremendous power of individuals collectively, how that can shape demand and how that can actually drive change upstream. And there were two quotes actually that I, that I love and I'm gonna push this real quick. Uh, Rabbi Heschel said, uh, few are guilty, all are responsible. And I think that's applicable here. And there was a US Supreme Court uh, Justice Louis Brandes who once said, um, sunlight is the best disinfectant and i think that really speaks to the power of uh, disclosure and and transparency uh, thank you for that rob and uh, as a reminder please put your hand your virtual hand up or add your comments in the chat we've got uh, lots of information and ideas uh, coming forward jacob um jacob is in tala she you've got a couple of comments in here that i find interesting you said nobody's mentioned growing space industry and space mining is that in the idea that this is potentially a solution to some of these or part of the problem? Jacob, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Go ahead and unmute um, yourself, Jacob. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, going back to the space industry, we have a way of maintaining our current standard of living, maybe perhaps even rising it if we invest in long term solutions of space mining, because, uh, say, developing of industries and production can, could be say, shifted to the moon in perspective of 40 to 50 years when uh, the capacity uh, of launching 
uh, different products in the space will be definitely lower. And when we are holding you know, some stuff from inner uh, belt, inner asteroid belt, then we definitely have some uh, possibilities of uh, getting uh, and sourcing rare earth minerals without devastating our own planet. And uh, some of the heavy industries can be shifted to the moon where there's no ecosystem that we could damage. So then it's basically just the cost of dropping ship, uh, dropping stuff on earth, which is definitely way lower than sending the stuff up in the space. So we can still maintain our industrial capacity but it will take time and definitely a lot of effort. Also, there is an issue of, uh, say, renewable energy. We can mm -hmm. harness way more energy from sun uh, uh, by just using solar sails around Earth's orbit than actually placing solar panels on Earth. So okay. that's it. So a couple of long visionary ideas there. And we've got in the chat. Thank you, Amanda. We had the director of the European Space Agency on um, on our platform of just a few days ago. And you've got some great input in his conversation. Uh, and thank you, Rob. You, you've indicated that you wrote a chat about um, it. You've put in an article about if we could use tobacco warning style labels around gas pumps so people understood visually what the gas that they put in their car has as an impact. Let me bring in Mariam um, Mbadi. You had a couple of points in the chat, and I picked up one of them that you said that there's a contradiction in the way that shareholders get dividends and then ESG initiatives, and so that this might be something that's creating a tension. Do you want to add a little bit more on that? Yeah, so um, uh, my name is Miriam. Actually, I'm an expert in financial markets and an entrepreneur as well. And so I'm uh, kind of at the crossing between uh, blockchain and uh, and finance. Um, I was actually uh, thinking about this uh, during the first pandemic that uh, today, the way financial analysts um, look at uh, estimate, let's say, stock price is based on the future cash flow models. And that future cash flow models doesn't even take into account the, the survival of the human species. So it's really uh, based on just how much cash the company would generate. And at the same time, we have uh, a lot of ESG data uh, that is uh, now mandatory to disclose. But uh, that data is not really integrated in the in the. Uh, in the pricing or in the estimation or in the valuation of a company. So basically today is just for the investors who are ESG investors who want to uh, uh, be responsible, uh, who would take into account of, of that data. So it's not really mandatory to take it into account. And we don't have an, um, a global ESG rating today. Um, like if we look at uh, Thomson Reuters, they have their own investment tools. Uh, for, um, uh, Moody's, they have their own. So it's like the whole ESG world is, uh, is really scattered, like private banks, they have different models as well, non-governmental, uh, uh, let's say uh, the IFC, the World Bank, etc. they have their own as well. So everyone has his own model and, and this landscape, in a sense, uh, should be consolidated so that we, we, can, we can push the ESG approach further. Okay. Thank you. And I, I know we've had a chat there, uh, someone in the chat who's mentioned from, from Bosnia talking about the importance of supporting young people with their ideas, entrepreneurial ideas around the circular economy and others that this could be useful. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time. We've just got 10 minutes left and I'm going to bring in a few more people before we, before we go. Um, uh, Raz... Razvan, you are the UN Youth Delegate to Romania. We're talking here about young people um, and creating trust, etc. Do you want to add something on that? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to be. You need to unmute yourself. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, very interesting and fruitful context of debate. And I'm really glad to be able to add some of the youth perspectives on this really important topic. I think that young people have to be a part of this uh, green and digital transition, and they have to be provided the mechanisms in order to actually be able to deliver their innovative ideas and their strategies for a sustainable future and for the fulfillment of the goals uh, included in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, of course. 
by encouraging and funding uh, young people's circle, circular economy initiatives and uh, social and green entrepreneurship initiatives in a marginalized community, I think that they could actually really contribute to the development of those uh, societies where uh, troubles and in inequalities are a main topic and a main issue that affect the actual potential of those uh, regions and uh, human communities. Also, research clusters in the field of environmental sciences are a very interesting perspective from uh, my point of view, because I've seen lots of young people actually wanting to be able to innovate in this domain and to be part of uh, research projects, but they don't have access to the tools needed in order for them to uh, be part of uh, such uh, context for uh, idea development. Thank also, you. education on uh, environmental security, uh, social security and uh, energy issues can be a very uh, important point in driving this change that we're talking about. Okay. And I think that... I need, I need to move on because we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Ravzan. To highlight the importance of young people, and of course, young people are the ones who have to live the longest of the consequences of uh, the green transition. So it was important to hear from them. I'm now going to be uh, inviting uh, Tavi and Lindsay, our two senior fellows on this issue, to give us a, a sort of overview of what it was that you think we're going to take from this conversation. Tavi, can I start with you? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very fruitful um, conversation indeed. And uh, I think we did get uh, complementary ideas to our uh, uh, already very good uh, working papers. So I think uh, the goal, at least in my um, view, uh, has been achieved definitely. So there are different, different aspects, different um, uh, angles and, and different uh, additions perhaps to, to take on, on board so I, I would just like to thank everybody uh, for, for that and and, uh, and lots of lots of angles that uh, yeah I, I personally have have never even uh, thought about anything from uh, from uh, space mining to to uh, to other very very kind of relevant ideas that are not at least from my perspective on the table um, uh, all the time uh, just only one thing, not to take too much of your time, only one thing that I would like to agree on uh, from personal experience uh, or more, more like it from Estonian experience. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what uh, uh, carbon um, quota trade uh, mechanisms have actually demonstrated is that uh, you can at some, uh, um, you know, if you, if you save your own emissions, you, you can invest this money to um, doing something even more meaningful. So, so the trade uh, mechanisms that uh, were mentioned, uh, but even, even more mentioned in the chat that I was trying to follow as much as possible, uh, they actually do make sense. And, and I want to just reiterate it as, as it has been more, more in the chat than, than in a conversation. So yeah, I, I don't take more of your time. I, I give it over to Lindsay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tavi. Lindsay, what have you taken from today's conversation? Thank you, Tamsin. Since earlier I said Rose, forgive me. So Tamsin, um, thank you, everybody. I think it's been a really rich and ultimately a very um, positive, um, hopeful discussion. Um, I, you know, with everything we've heard today, um, um, you know, and Mariam and um, also Rob, you were driving home this point about the importance of transparency, trust, they're inseparable, transparency, trust, disclosure, etc. What really um, strikes me at the end of today's conversation is the urgency of uh, governments and at the EU level, the EC level, of, of really providing us with this uh, regulatory framework, the metrics, in order for there to be the accountability. I think if we're going to uh, change things, um, it's that is indispensable. I think that's really going to be the key to unlocking a real, a real shift. Um, that's at least what I take away um, from all the various comments, um, depending on the different angles, whether you're, again, we're talking about financial markets or consumers or companies. And again, it comes back to this, um, to, to, to use the word you were using, um, 
Rob, is the disconnect that we seem to have everything there, but there's a disconnect. And I think it's really going to be at the governmental level and at the EU level. And will this, um, you know, the Digital Green Coalition help us to, to turn this around? I mean, I really hope so, um, but it has to happen. Thank you for that, Lindsay. And, and I agree, our, our conversation has been very rich and a lot in the chat as well. But uh, what I picked up myself was that, you know, we, we need to get some global agreements about certain key concepts. So this is around, you know, the carbon pricing, how we measure the carbon dioxide emissions and the reductions. We need to be clear about how we value the assets so that we can put into the balance sheets cost of the externality and the measure the message that came through i think very clearly is the money will flow to the right place when we've got this agreed way of how do we value these assets both the ones that as we said in the chat the stranded assets of the fossil fuel industry and the energy transition but also how do we value some of the newer things that are going to come on the market that achieve the transition when we've got this clarity an agreement, the money will follow, the decisions will follow, because the asset owners are interested in the long term. But there is still some gaps between that and the corporate governance mechanisms where we, we've got still rewards and short-term dividends that might overbalance some of these things. So lots of topics for us to pick up on, and particularly this is an area where Europe has a clear, clear play, playing field in the area of regulation. I'd like to say a warm thank you to everyone for participating. There's been some really good content. and I think we've moved the conversation forward, but this isn't finished because the next event in our Connected Europe activity series is a working group on resilient Europe. That will take place on the 11th of May and a policy event on the 22nd of June. So it follows this same process. Initially, there is a working group and then there will be an event to discuss the recommendations. So thank you to all of you for participating and spending this lovely sunny Tuesday afternoon. Thank you and goodbye from Brussels.